Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is July 30, 1979, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 48. In recent weeks we Americans have been reeling from one crisis to another. The gasoline crisis, the dollar crisis, with gold peaking at new record levels, the fall of Nicaragua, the alleged crash to earth of Skylab, rumors of a new Russia military command in Cuba, controversy over the SALT II Treaty, and above all the Carter Crisis with one shocking and unprecedented development after another. Meanwhile, in the background there is a continuing drumbeat of lesser mysteries to worry about. Chemical plants, refineries, and oil storage depots keep exploding and burning daily all around us. Railroad tank cars keep derailing, leaking, and exploding here and there, but these things have become so commonplace in the past two years that we hardly even pay attention anymore. Instead we wonder, why did those 41 sperm whales suddenly beach themselves and die last month on the Oregon coast? Even the marine biologists in that area leave us with the words, it may always be a mystery. But that soon fades from our minds, and instead our attention is diverted by pathetic television reruns of America's heyday in space a decade ago. As we watch the fuzzy picture of a spaceman as he steps gingerly onto the moon, for a moment it is once again July 20, 1969, and for a brief moment we thrill once again to those famous words of Neil Armstrong, that's one small step for a man one giant leap for mankind. For a moment we may forget how different it is today. Our manned space station Skylab is now officially dead according to NASA, while Russian cosmonauts are setting new records in their Soyuz 6 space station. And strangely, the American Space Shuttle just can't seem to get off the ground. What's happened to NASA, we may ask ourselves? And if we could land men on the moon, why can't we solve any of our other problems? But before we can think of any answers, our attention is diverted again. Here comes another bombshell from Washington, says the TV, and we forget everything else absorbed in the latest bewildering event in the Carter Crisis. My friends, news reports about these events always make them seem as if they were separate and unrelated. As a result, they seem to make no sense, and so we do as we are intended to do, we just throw up our hands. The more evil our leaders have become, the more we have decided to just trust them, and the more secretive our government has become, the more we have lied to ourselves that we knew what was going on. But the events I mentioned a few moments ago are not separate and unrelated. They are all parts of a bigger picture. Like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, each piece makes sense when you know what the total picture is. That is why in my AUDIO LETTER SERIES I keep focusing on the total picture. That is what I said I would do when I inaugurated the AUDIO LETTER SERIES in June 1975. Each month I can only highlight a few of the specific events that are pieces of the puzzle. But each month I try to add more to your own understanding so that you can learn to see the truth for yourself. For a long time careful listeners of my AUDIO LETTERS, recent events ought not to be any real surprise. For example, consider the fluctuating decline of the United States dollar and the fluctuating rise of gold prices. Lately many former anti-gold figures have jumped onto the gold bandwagon as if they had always been there, yet they tell you nothing about why these events are now taking place. My friends, the reasons are those which I made public six years ago in my book, five years ago in Congressional testimony, and then in my AUDIO LETTERS. Those who expected to benefit most from the death of the dollar began vanishing from the scene early this year of 1979. This began with the murder of Nelson Rockefeller, which I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 42. 
The following month I reported that his brothers David and Lawrence were also killed and replaced with doubles. It is now widely known in international banking circles that the real David Rockefeller is dead, but powerful long-range economic forces were unleashed years ago by the late David Rockefeller and his intimates. The death of a dollar was just one part of an elaborate plan for dictatorship here in America, followed by a one-world government. Another element of the plan was to be a Middle East war with the nuclear destruction of Arab OPEC oil wells. Over three and a half years ago I made the plan public in AUDIO LETTER No. 6, and in later tapes, for example Numbers 28, 37, and 41, I have kept my listeners informed about the status of this plan, and in AUDIO LETTER No. 41 last December 1978 I called attention to the Hate Saudi Arabia campaign which was building up here in America. The nuclear doom of Saudi Arabia was being planned for the spring, and the American people were being conditioned to accept it. In AUDIO LETTER No. 37 I had revealed the secret American plan by which the Middle East disaster was to lead to war with Russia. In March came the Egyptian-Israeli Peace Treaty, which was designed to set the stage not for peace but for war. But in late April 1979 events behind the scenes altered completely the direction of events. In AUDIO LETTER No. 46 two months ago I revealed how Russia stopped the secret nuclear war plan in its tracks, especially after the death of David Rockefeller. Meanwhile, only the tip of the iceberg of all this showed up here in America. Most Americans only knew that there was a gasoline shortage with long lines. What we were not told was that the so-called shortage was artificial. It had been timed to coincide with the Saudi Arabian disaster, which did not happen due to Russia's intervention. Now the oil companies are covering their tracks, releasing more gasoline, and most Americans still have no idea what the gas lines were really all about. And then there are those whales which beached themselves last month in Oregon. It was almost a rerun of the beaching of some 120 whales in Florida nearly two and a half years ago. In AUDIO LETTER No. 20 for January 1977 I had revealed that some huge secret American underwater missiles had been planted in the Atlantic Ocean off our east coast. These enormous missiles had begun rupturing and leaking plutonium from their warheads into the ocean. Early the following month the whales began beaching themselves near Jacksonville, Florida. The stories then were the same as we heard recently in Oregon. Somehow we were told the Florida whales must have gotten disoriented, but as I revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 21, their breathing had been disrupted by a fungus in their lungs, and the fungus was the product of the plutonium from one of the leaking missiles I had revealed. This time in Oregon the whale beaching was once again caused by plutonium-induced fungus in the lungs, but the source this time was not a leaking underwater missile. Instead, a different weapon of secret warfare mentioned in AUDIO LETTERS No. 20 and 21 is involved. Recently Russia resumed radiochemical warfare against the United States. Large remote control canisters have been dropped at sea at intervals along our Pacific, Atlantic, and Gulf coasts. These are spewing radiochemical warfare agents into our air on command whenever wind conditions are favorable. Most of the canisters use plutonium as one of their active ingredients. These renewed attacks so far are at a low, non-lethal level. Their purpose is not to kill but to promote low-grade ailments and to sap our strength and national will. But the whales that beach themselves on the Oregon coast last month, June 16, had high concentrations of plutonium in their lungs along with the other canister products. Apparently they surfaced very close to a canister off the Oregon coast. They breathe the air just as you and I do, and at that close range the canister gave them a dose that destroyed their ability to breathe, 
and so like the whales in Florida two and a half years ago, they beached themselves to die. In other ways, too, the United States is gradually being rendered incapable of going to war against Russia. In World War II the Western Allies brought Germany's war machine to a crawl by bombing chemical plants and disrupting rail transportation. Likewise, today American chemical petroleum and rail targets are being destroyed in a war of attrition by Russian sabotage. Russia's new rulers are taking no chances, my friends. Of all people, they know there is always the danger of being surprised and upset in their plans, and so even while they are trying to prevent nuclear war, they are still preparing to win such a war if it does take place. This even includes continuing preparations for a possible invasion of the United States from Canada and Mexico. I first revealed these activities 16 months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 32, and this is the explanation for the news reports just a few days ago about a major new Russian Army command structure in Cuba. Cuba is serving as a staging center for the steady flow of troops and arms into Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. This is going on secretly, but with the knowledge and cooperation of the Mexican Government. Early this year President Carter paid a visit to Mexico and was greeted with official contempt and hostility. Now you know why. Mexico, like Quebec Province and Canada, has already made her peace with Russia. Russia's preparations are already far advanced to enable her to survive and win all-out war, and yet as I have revealed over the past several months, Russia's new rulers are using every means at their disposal to prevent nuclear war. They are doing nothing less than taking control of the United States, working from the top down. Today I want to call your attention to major current events which are proving what I have been telling you all along. Because the AUDIO LETTER stands alone, you must use your own judgment in evaluating what I reveal, instead of depending on what anyone else says. The AUDIO LETTER, my friends, is not for the many, but for the few with ears to hear. My three special topics this month are Topic No. 1, the final chapter in the Great Skylab cover-up. Topic No. 2, The Secret War of the Walking Dead, and Topic No. 3, How America Will Relearn the Fear of God. Topic No. 1. On a midsummer day ten years ago this month, an estimated half billion people worldwide sat transfixed before television sets. We were watching a television image that was fuzzy, flickering in black and white, and yet it was awesome because we were watching the impossible take place before our very eyes. We were watching two American astronauts, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, the first two men on the moon. That day, July 20, 1969, was a great day to be an American. The impossible promise of an assassinated President John F. Kennedy had come true. On May 25, 1961, he had told us that America would put a man on the moon before the decade was out. So when Neil Armstrong stepped onto the moon's surface and called it a giant leap, he was right. In barely eight years we had leapfrogged past Russia to be first on the moon. In AUDIO LETTER No. 26 I explained why it was so important to beat Russia to the moon. It was all sold to us as a sort of Space Age Olympics, a peaceful sporting race to gather moon rocks, but it was actually a military crash program ten times bigger than the Manhattan Project in World War II, and its real purpose was to establish a secret base on the moon. From there revolutionary new beam weapons would become the key to ruling the earth. At the time of the Kennedy announcement in 1961, the United States was far behind Russia in space. 
but NASA planners had figured out a way to jump past Russia in order to get to the Moon first. The Russians were firmly committed to what is called the Earth Orbital Approach to Moon Flight. Under this approach, missions to the Moon would be assembled and launched from Earth orbit with the aid of space stations. This technique has always been recognized as the surest and safest route to the Moon. Even our own late great Werner von Braun had advocated the Earth Orbital Approach for more than a decade. The Earth Orbital Technique is like building a firm foundation before building the rest of the house. It's the right thing to do, but it takes time. NASA planners were given the task of beating Russia to the moon, and they soon concluded that we were too far behind Russia to catch up by the Earth Orbital Method. There was only one way we could beat the Russians. It was bold, but it was also very risky. It would be like building a house with almost no foundation for the sake of speed. It was called the Lunar Orbital Moon Mission. Under this plan, the first priority was to get men on the moon fast and start laying the groundwork for a moon base. Then with the moon in American hands, we could drop back and fortify our space logistics system. Its keystone was to be a space station known as Skylab, and that's how Project Apollo was conceived, with its predecessors Project Mercury and Project Gemini. NASA was gambling in several ways at once, but the gamble paid off. America did beat Russia to the moon. In December 1972, the Moon program was supposedly cut off prematurely with Apollo 17, but in AUDIO LETTER No. 26 I explained that the flights did not really stop. Instead, the Moon program was simply taken out of public limelight. Moon launch missions were shifted from the highly visible Cape Kennedy to the island of Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean. On May 14, 1973, Less than five months after the Apollo 17 moon mission, Skylab was launched. From then on, the secretly continuing American moon program began benefiting from Earth orbital techniques. By late 1977, plans called for the American military base in Copernicus Crater to be armed and operational. The base was to be armed with beam weapons which can blast any visible spot on Earth within two seconds. The weapons were to include eventually both lasers and particle beams. In the United States itself, particle beam research had been sent down blind alleys as a decoy, but in other locations worldwide particle beam weapons were being developed. It was an elaborate plan, and it almost worked. But on the night of the harvest moon, September 27, 1977, it all ended in catastrophe. Already the Soviet Union had begun orbiting operational killer satellites called Cosmos Interceptors. These are manned and armed with particle beam weapons. Two were in orbit by late September 1977, and one was armed with a deadly neutron beam. This was used to bombard the Copernicus base killing all the astronauts there, as I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 26. Only two days later the Russian manned space program suddenly came to life. The Salyut 6 space station was launched into orbit. Then cosmonaut crews began visiting Salyut 6 in a steady stream, which continues to this day. Even now the latest Salyut 6 cosmonauts have been in orbit more than 150 days. This far exceeds any record ever set by the United States. All this is in stark contrast to the fate of our own space station, Skylab. Earlier this month on July 11, NASA pretended that Skylab had unavoidably crashed from orbit, but Skylab actually came to an abrupt end 21 months ago, as I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 27. On October 18, 1977, a tremendous fireball flashed across the southwestern United States. The sky was lit up over a track nearly a thousand miles long. It was seen by thousands across at least five states, 
Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Missouri. Witnesses included pilots, military observers, and even the McDonald Observatory in far southwest Texas. It produced headlines all over the United States. People were asking what in the world was that. That, my friends, was Skylab. As I said that month, it was blasted out of space by a Russian Cosmos interceptor. The destruction of Skylab was part of Russia's program to terminate America's secret military control of space. Later that month, the Skylab cover-up by NASA got underway. Skylab was said to be sinking from orbit sooner than expected, but at first NASA pretended that Skylab could probably be saved by the Space Shuttle. There was never any chance, my friends, the Skylab could be saved because it was already gone. From time to time the Skylab cover-up story was revived, each time with more pessimism. Finally, last December 1978, NASA announced, with deep regret of course, that all plans to rescue Skylab were being abandoned. Those pesky sunspots were just bringing it down too fast to reach it in time with the Space Shuttle. From then on speculation mounted. Where would Skylab crash? India, China, the Andes, Russia, downtown Chicago? NASA spokesmen kept insisting that they had no idea. Even on the alleged final orbit this month, July 11, NASA pretended to be taken by surprise. They pretended to be trying to bring it down in the South Atlantic, but it overshot, they said. Then there were several minutes of dramatic silence from Skylab control in Houston. Then came the initial announcement of Skylab's official fate. Purely by chance, they said, Skylab had apparently crashed into the Indian Ocean. They pretended it was a surprise. But seventeen months ago, my friends, I alerted you to the Indian Ocean as being on NASA's mind for cover-up purposes. The Indian Ocean provides no witnesses to dispute NASA's claim of a Skylab reentry there. Nevertheless, NASA finally decided it would be much safer to provide something for people to see than to say it just disappeared without a trace. And sure enough, the initial NASA announcement about the Indian Ocean was followed by reports of sparkles in the sky over southwest Australia. NASA then said apologetically that a few portions of Skylab had apparently made it past the ocean, re-entering over Western Australia, but strangely enough the Australian Government said not a word. My friends, this final chapter of the Skylab cover-up involved another military secret which I made public in AUDIO LETTER No. 42. There's a large secret American missile base in the Northern Territory of Australia. The base is controlled by the military, not NASA, but Skylab was part of a secret military program, and so NASA received some military help in the Skylab cover-up. On July 8, only three days before Skylab's fictional crash to Earth, a worldwide military exercise called Global Shield 79 began. It received very little publicity here in the United States, and yet it was the biggest exercise in over 20 years by the Strategic Air Command. NASA scheduled the fictional end of Skylab to take place during this exercise. On July 10, two Minutemen 3 missiles were launched into the Pacific from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, but that same day another missile was also launched under cover of the worldwide exercise. It was launched from the missile base in Australia in coordination with NASA. The missile was unarmed, and so the Russian Cosmospheres overhead observed the launch without interfering. It was launched shortly past noon Eastern Daylight Time, which was the middle of the night in Australia. The missile headed northeast over Indonesia and the South Pacific into orbit. Nearly 24 hours later the orbital package was following the path that would soon bring it over Australia once again. A small retro rocket was fired, and re-entry took place over southwest Australia. 
It was time for maximum effect, nighttime in Australia and midday in the United States. The Oberdo package, consisting of ceramic fragments of a special design, created a nice fireworks display in the night sky. The very next day reports in the United States said that Australians were finding pieces of purported Skylab debris lying all around, and in the most famous case an alleged 17-year-old beer keg delivery man swung into action like a professional, traveling by chartered Learjet, commercial airplane, and limousine he raced to San Francisco, carrying a few nondescript black lumps. He beat the deadline for the $10,000 Skylab prize offered by the San Francisco Examiner. Those lumps, my friends, were merely chunks of volcanic rock consisting mostly of iron and carbon. But predictably, NASA said a few days later that they were probably from Skylab and the prize was awarded. Can you imagine? My friends, NASA has now closed the book on Skylab. It's just yesterday's news now, something we are supposed to forget about, but if we do forget it, we would deserve whatever may happen to us. Because the Skylab cover-up was elaborate and its purpose was to keep the truth from us, there are still very powerful forces in America who want to drag us all into war with Russia. But the message of Skylab is that if we let that happen, we will be committing suicide for ourselves, for our children, and for the United States of America. Topic No. 2 Two months ago I revealed that a revolutionary new intelligence weapon was being introduced by Russia. I refer to their organic robotoids. These are man-made, robot-like living creatures, perhaps best described as computerized animals. They are designed to simulate human beings almost perfectly in appearance and behavior, and yet they are not human. Robotoids are so far removed from the knowledge and experience of most people that they are very difficult for many people to believe. But now more and more major surprises are filling the news. That is, they are surprises if you do not know about Russia's robotoids. For example, consider the Middle East and the alleged gasoline shortage. Nearly four years ago, on October 12, 1975, I wrote an article on the op-ed page of the Washington Star. It was titled, Who's to Blame for Inflation? It's Time to be Fair to OPEC. The comments I made then are still true today. For example, we hear constantly about the increasing price of oil, but, quote, you must remember that products from the oil-consuming countries to the oil-producing countries are costing more each day." Unquote. And quote, thus oil price rises appear to be limited while the products of the industrialized countries are unlimited, open-ended. Is this fair? Unquote. When I wrote those words in 1975, I was out of step with the crowd. For the next three and a half years we were told increasingly that OPEC, especially Saudi Arabia, was our economic enemy. But suddenly in the past two months everything has changed. The hate Saudi Arabia chant in the major media has abruptly stopped, at least for the moment. Instead, stories are appearing about renewed trust between the United States and Saudi Arabia, and as if by magic the contrived gasoline lines are disappearing with promises of more gas on the way. It's all the result of the Russian robotoid shuttles to the Middle East, my friends, which I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 46. Russia stopped the war plan and robbed the big oil companies of their excuse for shortages. 
Now consider the SALT II Treaty. There is a relationship, my friends, between SALT II and, of all things, the Skylab debacle. There is nothing at all in the major media news about this relationship, but as my older listeners know, SALT II and Skylab are just tips of the same iceberg, and it's an iceberg that is already sinking our ship of state. Earlier I reviewed how the real story of Skylab's fate began on September 27, 1977. That was the day America lost the secret space battle of the Harvest Moon to Russia. Three weeks later a Russian Cosmos interceptor blasted Skylab out of existence. The real story of the present SALT II Treaty also began on September 27, 1977. That day Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko delivered a speech at the United Nations. By the time Gromyko spoke it was already clear that Russia was winning the space battle, so he spoke very harshly about American stalling on SALT II. He delivered what amounted to a veiled ultimatum. Then he left for Washington for a highly unusual nighttime meeting at the White House with the real Jimmy Carter and Secretary of State Cyrus Vance. Breathless reporters told the nation there had been a breakthrough in SALT II. But when I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 26 three days later, I revealed what had really happened. The stories about a SALT breakthrough were lies, cover stories to allay public concern. That's what my listeners heard in AUDIO LETTER No. 26, and for the following year and a half SALT II went nowhere. But early this year drastic changes in America's rulership began taking place. For the past six months the AUDIO LETTER has been focusing on these changes as they have taken place, and they have led, among other things, to a turnaround on SALT II. The changes began on January 26, 1979 with the murder of Nelson Rockefeller. That was the opening shot of a secret Bolshevik coup d'etat against America's real rulers. As I have explained in previous tapes, the atheistic Bolsheviks no longer rule Russia. They have been overthrown by a tough band of native Christians. Today Christianity is being reborn in Russia, but here in the United States the Bolsheviks want to create a new Bolshevik revolution. They want to seize control of America and then to strike back at their bitter enemies, the Christ Ones who now run the Kremlin. For several months the Bolshevik coup d'etat was moving fast. Important people were being purged and replaced by doubles, beginning with David and Lawrence Rockefeller and their intimates. And the weekend after Easter 1979 the Bolshevik purge claimed the lives of President Carter Vice President Mondale and their families. But as I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 45, the Russians then began to intervene. A secret war of doubles broke out, and by late April the White House was already under Russia's control. In AUDIO LETTER No. 46 I was able to let my listeners in on the key to Russia's success. They are using robotoids to replace and simulate powerful people. The United States is secretly becoming a Russian satellite state, and the American turnaround on SALT II came fast. On May 9, 1979, the robotoid replacements for Defense Secretary Brown and Secretary of State Vance made the initial announcement. An agreement in principle had been achieved on SALT II, and with lightning speed the treaty itself was signed in Vienna barely five weeks later. My friends, Russia signed with herself through Carter Robotoid No. 3 and Brezhnev No. 2, the human double for the late real Brezhnev. At first the new SALT II Treaty brought howls from Capitol Hill. We heard over and over that it was in serious trouble, but last month 
I reported the true situation. Salt II's most bitter opponents in the Senate are people who are playing ball with the Bolsheviks here in America. Russia is replacing them with rheumatoids, and the earlier hard line against Salt II is slowly evaporating. The shift is subtle so far, but it is clearly visible. For example, the late Senator Barry Goldwater worried constantly in public about verification. But on July 23, Robotoid Goldwater said, quote, I would not be too exercised over it now, unquote. An even more bitter Salt II opponent was the late Senator Henry Jackson. Jackson always played up the Russian threat. But on July 23, he accused Robotoid Defense Secretary Harold Brown of exaggerating that threat. He called it scare tactics to sell SALT II. Even our outgoing Ambassador to the Soviet Union, Malcolm Toon, is no more. Toon was publicly very suspicious of SALT II, but now a Toon Robotoid has abruptly started campaigning in favor of SALT II, and he won't explain the change. Robotoids, my friends, are a very powerful weapon, but as I pointed out in AUDIO LETTER No. 46, they are also very troublesome. They do not live long, especially under conditions of constant exposure and stress. They must also be programmed, and yet they are also somewhat unpredictable. Last month I described the process by which the holographic brain of a robotoid reproduces the memory of a person being duplicated. Other parts of the brain are altered so that the robotoid ends up as a robot-like being that obeys instructions, but the memory includes involuntary responses which sometimes produce unwanted behavior. This is turning out to be a severe problem in the case of the Jimmy Carter robotoids, because the real Carter had mental instabilities which are reproduced partially in the robotoids. The first signs of erratic behavior by the Carter Robotoids came in public comments about Senator Kennedy. The real Jimmy Carter had a strong personal dislike for Kennedy, and on several occasions Carter Robotoids have simply blurted out these reactions in very raw form. To a degree, this type of thing is a danger with all Robotoids. They do not possess truly human judgment. They appear to have it under certain conditions, but this is the result of programming for those situations. The problems of instability and short life cause robotoids to be best suited for interim purposes. For long-term purposes, human agents are still the best. For that reason, don't be surprised to see more and more new faces in high positions. Some of the new faces will themselves be robotoids, but some will be human beings. The Carter crisis of recent days demonstrates two things at once. One is the extent of secret Russian control that now exists in Washington. The other is the difficulty the Russians themselves are having with their robotoids. On July 1, Carter Robotoid No. 4 returned to Washington from South Korea following the Economic Summit in Tokyo. The scheduled Carter holiday in Hawaii was canceled, and the next day a Carter Energy speech was scheduled for the evening of July 5. Then the Carter Robotoid family disappeared to Camp David. Jimmy Carter Robotoid 4 was burning out and was disposed of. Robotoid 5 was next in line and had already been tried out several times. But on the 4th of July, the day before the scheduled speech, Carter Robotoid 5 went berserk. It was disposed of, leaving only Robotoid 6 on deck. Each new Robotoid is given exposure on a small scale first to test its wings, so to speak. For example, our alleged President goes fishing with a few friends or visits a farm family. But this had not yet been done with Robotoid 6 on July 4, so that left the Russians no choice. 
The speech was canceled without explanation. The Jody Powell Robotoid refused to answer reporters' questions. The press was stunned. Capitol Hill was shocked and dismayed, and Carter's own staff, those who are still human, were caught by surprise. The following evening, July 5, the White House Energy Group held a meeting. Afterward, the Washington Star quoted a key Administration official as saying that, quote, there was incredible disarray." Unquote. Meanwhile, Carter's political advisers supposedly were summoned to Camp David. By Friday evening, July 6, Carter Robotoid 6 was programmed and ready for initial controlled exposure. Thus began the so-called Domestic Summit at Camp David. Puzzled observers said they could not figure out what Carter hoped to accomplish with all this. The people invited to Camp David, after all, were people whose views were already known to Carter, almost without exception. A number of the participants, as they left, scratched their heads in puzzlement. Carter, they said, had talked little. He simply sat taking notes and nodding most of the time. My friends, two things were going on at Camp David. One was the controlled exposure I mentioned earlier for Carter Robotoid 6. But in addition, key individuals among the visitors were robotized. That is, the real person arrived, but a robotoid departed. The individuals who were robotized at Camp David have been identified from Nelson Rockefeller's hit list, which I discussed two months ago. Others were invited and left untouched as a smokescreen. All those on the list who arrived at Camp David are now dead. In their place are robotoids, carrying on in their places like programmed zombies. The people themselves are dead, and the robotoids are not conscious of being alive. And so the secret war of the walking dead goes on. On July 11, Skylab Day according to NASA, the Camp David Domestic Summit ended abruptly. Carter Robotoid 6 had started behaving erratically. Wall Street was rife with rumors that Carter had suffered a nervous breakdown. Robotoid 7 was brought onto the scene, and the next day Robotoid 6 was eliminated. Once again Carter was said to be at work on his energy speech. On Friday, the 13th of July, journalists who met with Robotoid 7 described Carter as, quote, a thoroughly chastened leader, unquote. Others called him a deeply troubled and worried man. Nevertheless, the next day Carter Robotoid 7 was sent forth to try his wings. Like a dead El Cid strapped to a horse, the seventh Robotoid copy of the late President Carter sallied forth. We were told that the President of the United States visited private homes near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and Martinsburg, West Virginia. Afterward, the Russian Robotoid Command in Novosibirsk must have sighed with relief. One of the hosts told UPI, quote, I feel better about him now. He's acting more like a President now." Unquote. That Saturday evening, July 14, Carter Robotoid 7 arrived on the White House lawn by helicopter at roughly 6.30 p.m., but the Russians were taking no chances. An Associated Press dispatch that evening described another unexplained strange turn of events. Quote, Members of the Press Corps who normally are allowed on the lawn to see and photograph the arrival were barred from doing so on Saturday. White House press officials gave no reason for the change except to say they saw no reason for the coverage." Unquote. The following evening, Sunday, July 15, Carter Robotoid 7 successfully delivered the long-delayed energy speech. But as it turned out, energy was only part of his subject. In that regard, the Russian program to nationalize the big oil companies was set in motion. That is what the so-called Energy Security Corporation is actually all about, and to cut down all bureaucratic obstacles to Russia's energy plans here, the Energy Mobilization Board is to be created. But the speech had a much broader thrust, dealing with the crisis of the American spirit. 
Some commentators have joked about the speech as Carter's Sunday night sermon, quote, unquote. but as I will point out briefly in Topic No. 3, we would be wise not to laugh, because, my friends, the words of the Carter Robotoid 7 came straight from the Kremlin, and the Kremlin is not joking. Even the speech itself was not without its mystery. The following day an article in the New York Times pointed out, quote, Another extraordinary development was that the White House had no advanced text of the speech, the President's ten days of deliberations notwithstanding. It was the first time in the memory of veteran reporters that no prepared text was released." Unquote. Even so, the speech gave the impression momentarily that things were finally back to normal but that impression was shattered less than 48 hours later. Shortly after 4 p.m. July 17, the Jody Powell Robotoid issued another brief surprise announcement to reporters. Something unprecedented had happened. The entire Carter Cabinet and all senior members of the White House staff had offered their resignations. Once again, the Washington establishment was shaken to its foundations. But if the resignations were a shock here, they were a lightning bolt overseas, because in other countries the resignation of an entire Cabinet means just one thing. It means the government has fallen. For the next few days news reports worldwide were filled with worried reactions. On all sides we were hearing words like dismay, bewilderment, disbelief. Senators and others described Carter as acting erratically. One said publicly, quote, We are worried about him having some kind of breakdown, unquote. Another said, quote, I think the President is nuts, unquote. Soon a Jimmy Carter robotoid may well flee the White House. That will leave 1980 as the year of the Dark Horse, because as of now every major potential Presidential candidate has been replaced with a robotoid. Two months ago when I first made public my intelligence on the Russian robotoids, I gave a warning. I knew many people would find them unbelievable, but I also cautioned that, quote, events in the days ahead will be impossible to understand without knowing this secret." Unquote. And now, my friends, those events are already taking place. Topic No. 3 There was a time in America not long ago when the fear of God was a meaningful phrase. To be a God-fearing man or woman was seen as a good thing. Such a person could be trusted and relied upon. But today in America the fear of God is generally thought of as an outmoded concept. If we think of our Lord Jesus Christ at all, it's as a baby in a manger or as the healer or as the feeder of 5,000. We forget that He also drove the money changers out of God's house with whips. We have reduced God to a convenience in our minds, even a servant. We think we can summon Him any time we need help, but forget about Him otherwise. Those are the attitudes in America today which arouse contempt and even anger in the new Kremlin. In AUDIO LETTER No. 38 I told my listeners about the struggle of six decades that led to the overthrow of the atheistic Bolsheviks in Russia. Russia's new rulers are Christians, and they endured incredible sacrifices. Now they are continuing their holy war against Bolshevism here in America by means of robotoids. We in America have not lifted a finger to save the soul of our own land from the hell of Bolshevism, so now the Russians are doing it. The Russians waited until the last possible moment to see if we American Christians would try to save our own country. But we are as blind today 
as Russia was six decades ago. So now, my friends, we have forfeited the chance to save America from Bolshevism ourselves. Now the Russians are doing it in their own way. The only alternative was to permit the outbreak of nuclear war. Rather than permit that, they are seizing control of the United States. Last month in Vienna, Leonid Brezhnev No. 2 startled the world by saying, quote, God will not forgive us if we fail. Unquote. Those, my friends, are words that signify the fear of God. And now that the Russians have begun taking over America, they consider it their duty to teach us the fear of God as well. In his July 15 speech, Carter Robotoid 7 said, quote, In a nation that was proud of hard work, strong families, close-knit communities, and our faith in God, many of us now tend to worship self-indulgence and consumption. Human identity is no longer defined by what one does, but by what one owns. But we have discovered that owning things and consuming things does not satisfy our longing for meaning. We have learned that piling up material goods cannot fill the emptiness of lives which have no confidence and purpose." Unquote. Those words, my friends, came straight from the Kremlin. That's why the official daily newspaper Pravda quoted the Carter speech without comment. The people who are becoming our new rulers are beginning to tell us what lies ahead for us. The things which cause us to take our Lord Jesus Christ for granted will be allowed to fall away from us. Already the props are being pulled out from under the artificial United States economy. Soon there will be economic collapse, hardship, regimentation, and the only way up will be through hard work, patience, and spiritual strength. In the hard times that lie ahead, my friends, there will be many who will say the Russians have no right to let us plunge into such troubles. But the fact is that we have forfeited the right to choose our own future. If the Russians had not intervened, thermonuclear war would now be virtually upon us. So now the Russians are going to do it their way, because our way was leading to total disaster. What is beginning to happen now is what I told my listeners a year ago in AUDIO LETTERS 35 and 36. We are witnessing the end of a way of life, our own way of life. In AUDIO LETTER No. 36 I said, quote, The selfish and self-destructive license of today will be stamped out, but it will give way to real human freedom rooted in eternal spiritual values." Unquote. That's what Carter Robotoid 7 was talking about on July 15, my friends, and that is what the Kremlin intends for us as they lay plans to teach us anew the fear of God. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.